Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. With the turn of each page, words spill out. Teaching, instructing, challenging. The words arrange, gather, and speak. They become etched into our reality. Faith turns into action until it becomes not only a part of our lives, but a new way to live altogether. Well, it is so good to see all of you this morning. How are you doing? Good, good. Still waking up. Okay. <laughs> well, it's good to see you this morning. Welcome to week four of our five-part series we are calling Encouraging Words. But first, as I always like to do, I like to take a moment, look into the camera, and say welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're glad wherever you are uh, that you could get behind the screen and join us today. We're glad you're along for the ride. Vineyard, would you put your hands together and welcome those of our church family who are online? Yeah, that's awesome. We're glad you're here. Well, before I jump into the message, I wanted to highlight one of the announcements, and that was the men's night. That is tonight. is our first ever men's night we're doing. It's at 6 p.m. here at Vineyard, so men of Vineyard. I, know, I see you out there. You are invited. It's 100% free. So bring a friend, you know, bring a few friends. We'll have tons of protein. It'll be a good time. You know, I was actually at Walmart the other day, kind of picking up a few last minute supplies for that event. And I was kind of, I couldn't find everything I needed. So I ended up having to grab a young guy who worked there to help me find some stuff. And as he was helping me out, we got, we were talking and he's asked me, what is all this stuff for? And I said, oh, we're doing this men's night. And I can't tell you what it is because it's secret. But he was like freaked out, well, what is all this for? I said, it's men's night at a church. At a church? You guys need this stuff? I said, yeah. He's like, that sounds cool. What are you doing? And I said, hey, we're actually, one of the cool things we're doing is we're playing knocker ball. Have you ever heard of that? He's like, no. And I said, well, we were getting these huge plastic balls. And you get in them, you can run on your feet, and then you just find a guy, and you smack the snot out of him. <laughs> and just put him on his back. He said, whoa, I'm going to be, I'm gonna be there. So... <laughs> I'm looking to see him there tonight. So it's going to be a good time. You won't want to miss it. Well, if you want to pull out your outlines, that should be in your programs, which you got at the doors as you came in. Um, that'll allow you to follow along with me today as I go through a message. I have a couple blanks for you. Uh, there's also some spaces on there for you to take notes. And if you haven't been taking notes, I encourage you to. This is a great series to take notes, uh, some personal notes on, because uh, we're looking at encouraging words from God to you, from God to you through his word, and that is the Bible. Well, we can all use encouraging words. Uh, I don't know about you, but I can. You can ask my wife, Olivia. My love language is words of affirmation. So if you ever want to show me some love, you can come up to me and say something like, you know, Samuel, you're looking extra tall today. <laughs> Why, thank you. Why, thank you. Well, that, that's the one my wife uses a lot, so. <laughs> no, but I think deep down, we not only like words of encouragement, but we need them, especially when we're facing periods of doubt or things are a little difficult. Maybe we're in a season of difficulty. We're facing some challenges in life. Maybe you've recently experienced a failure. Just maybe you're just being overwhelmed by all the things that are going on in life. It's in those times that we really need words of encouragement. And here's the truth. No matter who you are, you will experience a challenge in your life. Everyone will. It doesn't matter who you are. You will experience a test. And it's in those times that we really need the words of encouragement. But that's why God is so awesome. Because he gives us those words. He gives us those words of encouragement through his word. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, you can open those up if you want to follow along. The verses are also on your outlines. We're going to start in the book of James, and then we're going to jump to Hebrews uh, for the rest of the message. Well, today we're going to be following a biblical character named Abraham, and he went through a series of tests in his life, and we're going to look at those, uh, and we're going to kind of see how those are going to affect our lives, because those will be the same tests. Well, James, we're starting there. He lays out that life is a series of tests. James says that the problems that we have that come to us are actually tests. We can see that in James chapter 1, starting at verse 2. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Jumping to verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. In the life of Abraham, which we're going to look at, we will see four tests. And 
I want you to really pay attention to those four tests because they will be the same four tests that we all will experience at some point in our life. Now, me personally, I've been in school my entire life, from the day I was born to today. I, I, I can't seem to escape. It's like a prison you can't get out of. I'm still in school, and if I've learned anything in all my schooling, it's that preparing for tests is a good thing. <laughs> you generally do better when you prepare for tests. And I don't know about you, but personally, uh, my favorite kind of tests and the, things, and the tests I've learned the most from are tests where the teacher, the professor, gives you the questions in advance. Doesn't give you the answers, but gives you the questions and says, hey, study this. This is what you're going to need to know. And I take the questions home. I do the research. I study them. And I not only do well in the tests, but I really do learn more. I hold on to the info. I don't just regurgitate it. I hold on to that information. Now, there are some teachers. I love teachers. I'm married to one. But there are some teachers that are not the nicest people. They have a skewed perspective in the classroom. And they find it as their mission to make the class as difficult as it can be. You know, I had a few of these professors in college where I'd sit down with them and I would say, hey, how do I get an A in your class? And they'd look at me, Samuel, Samuel, a C is an A in my class. I, Whoa, I got to drop this class. <laughs> it's going to be hard. You know, but some teachers, unfortunately, they, they do that. They say, hey, I remember I had one teacher said, hey, for this first test, you're going to study everything from the syllabus, which is what you get on day one, to the captions under the pictures in the book. I was like, oh, my goodness. You know, I'm panicked, I'm stressing out, and I'm not learning anything. You know, but let me give you some peace. That's not how God's tests are. God wants you to pass his test. So he gives you the questions in advance. Hey, these are the tests that are coming. Get ready. I want you to pass them. These are what are coming. So that's why we're going to look at Abraham and the four tests he went through. And we not only want to look at the tests, but take notes on how he responds. Because that's key. How Abraham responds really reveals how a true believer should respond. Somebody who really trusts God is supposed to respond to these test questions in a certain way. So we're going to look at that. So starting in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. Why don't you circle where? Where is the important word there? See, the first test of life is major change. Major change. God asked Abraham to pick up everything he had and to go. And Abraham's question was where? Where? That's the first test question is where? Major change is difficult. Where am I going? I'll let you know. How long is it going to take? I'll let you know. When do I know I've gotten there? Well, I'll let you know. That's serious faith in God. I don't know if I could do that. That's tough. That's some serious following God. And it was major change for Abraham. At this point in his life, Abraham was 75 years old. Uh, he was no longer a spring chicken. It, w it was a big deal to move. You know, he was getting ready to retire, and God said, no, I want you to aspire. He was getting ready for Social Security, and God said, no, you're going to have some social insecurity coming your way. <laughs> you know, Abraham's hanging the hat, kicking back. God said, no, get up, dust it off. This is about to be the biggest adventure of your life. See, if you sit back, you'll miss that. Change is hard, but God acts through change in a lot of times. Not only was Abraham in his golden years, I like to call it, he was also very wealthy, which meant at that time he had a lot of possessions. He had a lot of stuff. And they didn't have U-Hauls back then. You know, they had camels and sheep. So <laughs> it was a big deal to move. He was a fat cat in the Mesopotamian city of Ur, and he was, he was comfortable. And God said, no, go. Pick it all up and go. And what did Abraham do? He did that. He picked it all up, didn't look back, and he went. See, that's the test right there. And look how he responded. The first test of a real believer. How will you respond? Well, a real believer will follow God's leading without knowing where. Will follow God's leading without knowing where. Some of you are asking the where question right now. God, where do you want me to live? Where do you want me to work? Where do you want me to retire? Where, where should I go to school? Where? I don't know where. You know, and how does God say we should respond to this? Take a step. Trust me. I'll direct you. You just walk. I'll direct you. You got to lean into me. I'll guide your steps. God says, start moving. Here's the truth. If your faith has not taken you to a place where you've taken some risk, it's not really faith. You know, John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Movement, 
used to spell faith R-I-S-K. It's true, though. The first test is major change. The second test is a delayed promise. A delayed promise. This is the test that causes us to ask that question, when? When, God? Looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9. By faith he made his home in the promised land. Like a stranger in a foreign country, he lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs of him of the same play, same promise. There's a word that's used twice in there. I want you to circle it. It's promise. Because that's a very important word in the vocabulary of faith, promise. Especially when it comes to the question of when. God said, I'm going to give you the promised land. And Abraham said, when? See, and this is important because God wants us to base our lives on promises, not on explanations. He wants us to trust him. I have something for you, Samuel. Listen to me. Trust me. You know, Abraham, he waited a while. There was a delay in his promise. Even when he got to the promised land, we see that there was a delay. He didn't, oh, I get the land now. No, there was a delay in that. He not only waited his lifetime, but he waited the lifetime of his son Isaac and Isaac's son Jacob. That's three generations. They were living in tents. Now, I'm not a camper, so that just is a nightmare to me. I would never, my kids and grandkids all living in tents. I can imagine Sarah now, his wife, Abraham's wife, going, Abraham, when are we going to get a real house? I'm sick of this little tent. You know, that's a long time. But there was a delay. There was a wait. There was a wait. You know, there are some tests in life that uh, we, we like, oh, I can get tests. Not all tests are that difficult, especially the tests where you can see the finish line. Those are the ones you're like, oh, I like those. I like a challenge. There's the end right there. I can get there. I know I just got to get right here, and then I've, I, I made it. Well, the hardest tests are the ones where you can't see the finish line, where you can't see the end. It's right outside of your view, and, and honestly, you don't know if it will end. It's those challenges that just seem to keep on going. How did a Abraham had a challenge like that? It went beyond his lifetime. And how did he respond? Well, he never gave up. He never went back to Ur. He stayed there. And here's the lesson. A real believer will wait for God's timing without knowing when. A real believer will wait for God's timing without knowing when. Some of you are going through the when test right now. When, God, when are you going to listen to me? When is my marriage going to get repaired? When is that friend I'm at odds with, when is that going to get fixed, God? When is my kid going to start listening to me? <laughs> when? It's the when question. It's a delayed promise. What is something in your life that you've been waiting for that hasn't happened? You've been waiting for God to do it, but it hasn't happened yet. Abraham had to wait three generations. What's something you've been waiting for? You know, when I think about waiting and I think about our church, you know, I think about our elevator. We, are, we want an elevator. And, you know, a lot of our leadership team is asking, when, God, when? When? You know, when I was preparing this message, I felt like we needed to put a sign up there. This is a test. This is a test. And if you pass it, the elevator will come. See, all of God's saints in the Bible had to experience a waiting test. They experienced a delay. Moses had to wait 80 years. Noah, 120. Abraham, his entire lifetime. A real believer will experience this test. It's the waiting test. So, a major change. How does a believer respond? Well, a real believer will follow God's leading when he doesn't know where. A delayed promise. A real believer will wait for God's timing when he doesn't know when. And then the third test is an impossible problem. An impossible problem. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11 says, By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered God faithful who made the promise. We've talked about Abraham before. Abraham at this point is 99 years old and he still doesn't have a kid. And God had told him, you will be the father of many nations. In fact, he actually changed his name to mean father of many nations, which is kind of embarrassing actually. You know, he has no kids. You know, somebody, hey, what's your name? Father of many nations. Whoa, how many kids you got? None. How old are you? 99. Right. <laughs> That's why. It was embarrassing. It was an impossible problem. How so? Well, it was a physically impossible problem. You know, Sarah had already gone through menopause by this point. They were old. They were not. They were past that kid age. They were, they were out there. But 
So, you know, the Bible says when they were told they were going to have a kid, they laughed. You know, that's how, I mean, if you're laughing, you know you're past that point. You know, oh, that's funny. We're not having kids. But they actually ended up naming their son Isaac, which means laughter. You know, the Bible says when they were told they would have kids, Abraham looked at his body and said, no way. Sarah looked at her body and said, double no way. <laughs> it's not happening. Abraham laughed. Sarah laughed, but God had the last laugh. It's funny. An impossible problem. What test question is that? Well, that's the how question. It's not the when. It's not the where. It's the how question. How? How are you going to do it, Lord? How is this going to happen? When I think of impossible situations or impossible problems, I think of a story I was once told about three hikers named Joe, Dave, and Bob, and they were experienced hikers. They had done a lot of hiking, but this time they wanted to do a more challenging trek. So they took on a trail they had never done before, and while they were hiking, they came to a huge river that was violent and raging, and it looked very dangerous. But, you know, being three guys who were getting ready for men's night tonight, <laughs> they said, hey, we got to get across this river. And they decided, hey, we can't do it by ourselves. They were Christians, so they decided we got to pray. So Joe said, I'll pray first. I'll pray for me, and then I'll go, and then you pray. And they said, okay, okay. So Joe prays. He prays, God, you know, give me the strength to cross this river. I need strength. And poof, God gives him these massive arms and massive legs. He, ha he dives in the river, swims across, almost drowns about a dozen times, but makes it across. It takes him about two hours to get across. Well, Dave looks and he's like, okay, I think I got it. So he prays. He says, God, give me the strength and the tools necessary to cross the river. Poof, a rowboat appears. He's like, I'm, I'm doing well. He hops in, rows across, almost capsizes about five times, but he makes it across in about an hour. Well, Bob, he's watched both. He's like, okay, I got it now. I got it. I know what I'm going to do. He prays. He says, God, give me the strength, the tools, and the intelligence to cross this river. Well, poof, he turns into a woman. <laughs> <laughs> she looks at her map, walks 100 yards up river, and crosses the bridge. <laughs> if you don't want that to happen to you, come to men's night. <laughs> Well, it's goofy, but I mean, hey, impossible problems are real. It seems like, man, how in the world is this ever going to happen? How is God going to do this? That's the impossible problem. It's the Abraham thing. How in the world am I going to have a kid? I'm 99. There's no way. It's impossible. It's impossible. You know, some of you are probably in those hows of your life now, but you've actually, you didn't realize because you just put it on the shelf as something that's not going to happen. You know, how am I going to have a child, God? I've already had three miscarriages. There's no way I'm going to have a child. How am I ever going to get married? I've never even been, been asked on a date. How am I going to repair that relationship with my kid who doesn't talk to me anymore? So those how questions that you've just put on the shelf because it's impossible from your viewpoint. Well, how does Abraham respond? And that's the test of a real believer, because this will come. Well, a real believer will expect a miracle without knowing how God intends to do it. There's one more test, and we see it in Abraham's life. And this test, I'm so glad God gives us the heads up on, because it's the ultimate test, and every one of us will experience it. You can count on it. You can count on it. The fourth test is a senseless tragedy. A senseless tragedy. These, this question isn't the when, it's not the where, it's not the how, it's the why questions. Why, God, why? It's the ultimate test. Abraham faced it and you will too. You will. You know, about seven years ago, uh, my grandfather uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And if you have a family member who's had that disease or you know somebody who's had that disease, you know how hard it is on the individual as well as the family. It's a very tough disease, disease to go through. And I, during that time, I found myself asking God that question a lot. Why, God? Why? Why? And it was especially difficult for me because my brothers and I had a great relationship uh, with my grandparents. We grew up calling them Grandpa T and Grandma K. And uh, they were... We, we loved them. We got to hang out with them, uh, you know, once or twice a year. They lived in Arizona. 
but we also got to watch them. They were some of our first role models in how to take your God-given passions and gifts and do ministry with that. You see, for a large part of their lives, they were missionaries. And they weren't just any missionaries, they were actually clown missionaries. You know, I think we actually have a photo of them. Uh, they were called Lolly and Pop. That was their clown names. There they are. There's Lolly and Pop. Yeah, so it was cool to watch them take their God-given personality, which was joyful and a bit crazy, <laughs> and mix that with their gift for missionary work and evangelism to share the love of God with other people. They took that mixture and they made a difference in so many people's lives. I got to watch them live out their purpose that God had for them. That was very cool. You know, they actually came with our outreach team a few times. We go to Mazatlan, Mexico, and they came with us and partnered up with us. And they actually one time even got Pastor Andy to become a clown. And I think we actually have a picture of him too. There he is. <laughs> so if you wonder why he thinks he's funny, it's because he's literally a clown. So <laughs> well, you can see why it was so tough for me to watch the brain disease eat away at uh, the clown I knew. It was very hard. God, why? It just didn't make sense. It didn't. You know, but the truth is there's a lot in the world that doesn't make sense. People all the time screaming, it's unfair. It's unfair. Well, whoever said it's going to be fair? You know, God didn't say that. He didn't say it's going to be fair. No, that's actually why there's a heaven and, there ha and a hell, because God's going to settle the score at the end. You know, if Hitler gets to get away with all the atrocities he committed, that's not, no, God's going to settle that score. So I believe in hell because of the fairness of God just as much as I believe in heaven. It's a senseless tragedy. Well, there's an issue here in Abraham's story that I want to look at that this thing, this question, the why question, gets questioned more than anything else in the Bible, this piece right here. It's when God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son. So many people question it. Isaac, the miracle boy, the boy they were never supposed to have, the boy that God's promise was actually built on, the promise to be father of many nations. That can't happen without Isaac. Isaac meant everything to Abraham, and God asked him to sacrifice him. You know, when people hear that, they go, what? That's not Christianity. That's crazy. No way. Somebody added that. That's not, no, that's not God. It doesn't make sense. Well, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, why don't you circle that, tested, tested him offered Isaac as a sacrifice. And even though God said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. See, Abraham was having a test of his commitment here. It didn't make sense. It was ridiculous. It was tragic. There was no precedent for this. You know, it's actually interesting. Looking back, we have the foresight to kind of know about Jesus and, oh yeah, God's a loving God, compassionate. I just sang a song about him. He's a great God. But Abraham, there was no precedent for this. Abraham didn't know, he had never seen Jesus. He didn't know God like we know God. He just knew that he was being asked to kill his son. It was tragic. It didn't make sense to him. It was unfair. And Abraham had no assurance that God was going to save his son. You know, we look and we go, yeah, yeah, God is going to come in at the last second. But Abraham didn't know that. He didn't know God was going to save his son or spare his son. But he did have something. Let's look at verse 19. Abraham reasoned that God could ra raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did raise Isaac back from the dead. What was Abraham's confidence? Well, if God can give me a son at 99, then surely he can raise my son back from the dead after I sacrifice him. He had a confidence in God's purpose. But here's the point of Abraham's life, and this is important. This is why he was such a great believer, is that Abraham decided that God had the right to make any demand on his life he so chooses. See, Abraham surrendered it all to God. Hey, you got everything. It's all yours, including my son. It's all yours. And the same is true for you and me, too. If we can see that God really owns everything in the first place, we would be nothing without God. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be breathing. I wouldn't have the family I do. It all belongs to God, really. So Abraham had that perspective of, hey, I'm just surrendering it back to you. It was never mine in the first place. And God did raise Isaac from the dead, as you know, because he was never supposed to be born in the first place. He was never supposed to exist at all. And yet he was born. Here's the point, though. 
A real believer will trust God's purpose without knowing why. Will trust God's purpose without knowing the why, even in the contradictions of life. See, this is the mark of a true believer here. My grandfather didn't know the why, but he still trusted in God's purpose. He trusted that God would be glorified through all situations and circumstances, even when it didn't make sense. So my grandfather, before the brain disease really took a hold of him, he took a lot of uh, time out of his schedule to actually train and equip a guy down in Mexico named Jorge. He taught him how to do the clowning in the ministry and how to do that uh, without him so he could do it, you know, the day he couldn't go anymore. He actually gave him some of his clown outfit pieces as well, which is a big deal because I'm letting you behind the curtain of the clown world. The clowns, each outfit is unique. No two clowns wear the same outfit. So the fact that he gave him some custom-made clown pieces was huge. You know, that picture was Jorge teaching some people how to do clowning. You know, and because of that decision, he trusted in God's purpose without knowing the why. It had a lasting impact. When my grandfather went to be with the Lord in 2012, and uh, because of his decision to trust in God's purpose, his ministry still continues to this day. That picture you just saw was actually from like two years ago, not long ago at all. His ministry still continues in his they're teaching clowns and more clowns. Clowns teaching clowns. It's actually kind of dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but the ministry is still going on. And honestly, they're probably touching more people than he ever could by himself. See, because of his willingness to trust in God's purpose, even when he didn't know the why, God used him to create a legacy. Used his passion. His legacy continues. His ministry still continues to this day. Some of you are going through the why questions right now. And they're the tough ones. They're not the ones on the shelf. Those are the ones deep inside your heart that you've either pushed down or are screaming. You know, it's the why. Why, God, this doesn't make sense. Why did I get fired? Why did my spouse leave me? Why did my spouse have an affair? Why is my child deciding to get hooked on drugs? Why? It just doesn't make sense. Why? And I want to say it's okay to ask those questions. It is. We see Abraham ask those questions. But it's in how you respond that's important. How do you respond? Respond, especially when God's silent. When he doesn't answer the why. How do you respond? This is why it's the test of a real believer. You know, if I were to ask you, do you believe in God, some of you would say, yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, uh, yeah, sure, I believe. I believe there's a God. But I wouldn't be so quick to jump on that. Gallup took a poll a few years back, and they found that 96% of Americans say they are believers. That's a lot. And when they asked them, what does that mean? They say, I believe in a God. Well, big deal. You know, the Bible says that the devil believes in God. The Bible says that demons shake and tremble because they know God. But see, it's more than just an intellect no. Yeah, I know God. No, how do you respond? Well, a real believer will follow God's direction when he doesn't know where. A real believer will wait on God's timing when he doesn't know when. A real believer will expect a miracle when he doesn't know how. And a real believer will trust God's purpose, love, and character when he doesn't know why. It's a test. You know, God never gave Abraham an explanation for any of these tests. You know, there's a reason there's so many kind of spiritual babies in, you know, especially in the millennial culture, is because we expect an explanation to everything. <laughs> you got to give me an answer. But it, it's true with God, too. A lot of us actually carry that. With, we, I need to know the answer. Why? Why? You know, instead of just trusting in God. Instead of just, hey, it's all yours anyway. You're in control. I just follow you. See, that's the test. The difference between God's test and human tests. Human tests, you have to know all the answers going into it to ace the test. But with God's test, you just trust and believe when you actually don't know any of the answers. That's how you ace God's test. Is you trust in Him. You trust in His purpose for your life. Which of these tests are you going through right now? You're probably going through one because these are the four tests that 
circulate around in life over and over again? Is it the major change, the where's? Where am I going to go? What, what, where am I going to live? Where am I going to retire? Where am I going to serve in the church? Where do you want me? See, you know you're in the where place when you know something's got to change. When God's saying, hey, something's got to change, you just don't know how to do it. That's the major change place. And what does God say? God says, trust me, I will point you in the right direction. Take the step. Trust me. Some of you are facing the second test in life. That's the, the when, the delayed promise. When, God, when am I going to get out of debt? When am I going to get healed? When are you going to answer my prayers, God? When are you going to restore my marriage? When? It could be the impossible problem, the house. It's on the shelf because from your viewpoint, it's just impossible. There's no way. How are you going to do that, God? How are you going to, how are you going to even make that happen? It's not possible. Some of you are going through that tragedy. You're feeling sadness or pain because of that senseless tragedy. It's the why question. Why? Why did my child die? Why did my spouse leave me and I have to raise these kids on my own? Why? Why are there atrocities happening all over the world? Why? Well, it's a test. You know, I gave you those sub points on your outline to kind of rate yourself as a believer. How does a real believer respond to these tests? You know, I talked to somebody last night and they're like, hey, Samuel, I flunk. <laughs> I flunk on all four. Hey, that's where it starts, actually. He's recognizing, hey, I got to trust in God. You know, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and this isn't on your outline, it's in Mark chapter 9, is when a man brings his son to Jesus. He says, Jesus, heal my son. And Jesus looks at the man and says, if you believe, then I will heal your son. See, God acts in our life according to our faith. He says, trust me first. I got you. I'm going to be there. The man says, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. And I love this story so much because that's it. That's enough. Jesus heals his son right there. That's all it takes is just a little bit of faith in a big God to get big results. You know, I have little faith. I, you know, I stand up here. You might think I'm this big faith guy. I'm not. I do not have dynamic faith. I have little faith. I experience fears all the time, doubts all the time. But I've come to understand that it just takes a little bit of faith in a big God is what gets big results in my life. It's how I can take on those tests. It's a little faith in God. Would you bow your heads with me? Come Holy Spirit. Yes, Father. Well, I just pray for everybody in this room. Whatever place they're at, whatever their circumstances are, whatever test they're personally experiencing, I pray that you remind them how a real believer will respond. How does a real believer respond when you don't know the how, or the when, or the where, or the why? Well, we trust in you. We trust your leading. We trust your power. Yes, Father. But it all begins with trusting you. We saw in Abraham's story today that even the very first test began with a choice to follow you, a choice to follow your words, to follow your commands. That's step one. It's following you. You know, I like to describe my relationship with Jesus 
as surrender. That's the one word I like to use because that's literally what it is. You're surrendering everything. I follow you. I leave it all behind. I surrender. And that's where it begins. You will never, ever be able to overcome any of these tests in your life if you don't first take that step. Because all the other questions, all the other ways to take on those tests hinges on this one step, and that's following Jesus. So I want to invite you, if you've never taken that first step, or you kind of have, oh, I've, yeah, I believe in God. I was probably in that Gallup poll. Well, hey, I encourage you, take that step. I invite you to take that step of faith. Take the risk. Follow Jesus. If that's you, would you just pray with me? Dear Jesus, come into my life. I surrender it all to you. All the goods, all the bads, all the things I've done wrong. God, I just surrender it all to you. I surrender my life. Lord, I believe in you, in your promise, in your promise for me. Jesus, I believe that when you died on that cross, that was the fulfillment of the promise for me. That you will always be there forever. Jesus, I love you. May my relationship with you never be the same. May it grow deeper every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.